My dearly beloved in Christ, we have all heard this gospel many times and reflected upon the meaning to beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And especially the part where our Lord says, you can tell a tree by its fruit. A bad tree does not bear good fruit, and a good tree does not bear bad fruit. Now this gospel has several different applications. For example, our friends or companions. Who do we associate with? Well, if someone uses bad language, bad behavior, we think, well, I don't want to associate with this person. I don't want to become a close friend of this individual because of that bad fruit. So we can apply it in different ways, but especially this gospel is applicable to what happened 50 years or so ago with Vatican II. And our Lord said to beware of those false prophets who come to you in the garment, in the clothing of sheep, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And is that not exactly what happened? Where there were modernists who pretended to love God, to love the church, to want only the good of souls, and yet they sowed the seeds of their modernism, their new doctrines, and undermined the faith. And then our Lord says, you can tell a tree by its fruit, and so forth. What are the fruits that came about with these changes in the church of in the 1960s, primarily, with Vatican II, and then especially the few years after Vatican II? And those of us who remember well that time recall that in particular, the bad fruit that was really apparent was the loss of vocations. So many priests left the priesthood. So many nuns left their convents. And so many Catholic schools had to close down. And why did that happen? Well, we can talk about the doctrinal changes, the new mass, etc. But especially, it was an embracing of the world. And this especially was noticeable at the time of Vatican II. In fact, even in speeches at Vatican II or explanations for the laity about what its purpose was, words were used such as this, well, we need to have an encounter with the world. That was one of the buzzwords, an encounter. But the idea was that the world is not so bad and we need to embrace the world. Well, yes and no. And we have to understand here, on the one hand, our Lord came into this world to die for all men, to redeem everyone, to bring about the salvation of immortal souls. So he, he died for all men. But he also said, my kingdom is not of this world, because there is a spirit in the world that is opposed to God. There is a spirit in the world that is anti-Christ and everything our Lord stood for. And what is that spirit of the world? It is one of pride, of rebellion, of vanity, of disobedience to God's laws. That's the spirit of the world that we must reject to renounce the spirit of the world. We read in so many uh, spiritual books, the saints telling us, to renounce the spirit of the world. And we know what they mean by that. All of that in the world that tends to pull us away from Almighty God and His holy will. On the other hand, yes, we do want to bring about the salvation of souls. And so we look at the missionary uh, labors of the church down through the centuries, and we see that going out into the world, but to save souls not to become part of that spirit of the world. And that is indeed what Vatican II brought about, is that spirit of the world coming into the church. And again, I've, I've read different statistics, I don't have them in front of me, but thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of vocations lost within the first five to 10 years after Vatican II. 
nuns, first of all, shortening their habits, and then in a short time, not wearing a habit at all, and then be becoming concerned with their hairstyle, that type of thing. In this regard, speaking of hairstyles, we um, priests are reading in our breviary right now lessons from the books of Kings. And just yesterday, there was the story of Absalom. You remember that story? Absalom was, I think, the oldest son of David, of King David, at least one of his sons. I believe he was the oldest. And Absalom decided that he wanted to be king. So he, in a very subtle way, he began turning people away from King David and turning them to himself. And then at one point, he declared his rebellion. And so he, he raised an army and he went to battle against his own father, against King David and King David's army. And the final battle was a complete victory for David and a complete destruction of the army of Absalom. But he was trying to flee from the scene of battle and he was seated on a, and I'm sure you've heard the story, he was seated on a mule and he was running through a thicket in the woods and his hair, he had this long hair that he was so proud of. And the hair got caught in the branches of a tree and the mule kept going, and there he was hanging in the air from his hair that was all entangled in the branches of this one tree. And the general of David's army then pierced him through with the lance. But you might say he was caught by his own vanity because he was very vain about his hair, his appearance, and again, wanting to be in charge, wanting to be the king, and that that which was part of at least of his own vanity became his very downfall. So that spirit of the world is something we must reject. St. Louis Marie de Montfort has a wonderful booklet, it's small, called the Friend, or A Letter to the Friends of the Cross. Because he says those who are followers of Christ are really followers of the cross. And in that booklet he says, can you imagine if Jesus Christ is the head of the mystical body and we are the members, but if the head is crowned with thorns, if the head of the mystical body suffered, etc., then do we want to be uh, clothed in and, and surrounded with delights and pleasure, etc.? What a contradiction. Where the head, Jesus, our head, was crowned with thorns, was crucified, suffered and died. And we want to be pampered. We want to have everything easy. And that's why you read in the lives of the saints and you see how they did penance. They mortified themselves and especially they renounced the spirit of the world. So St. Louis says in this booklet, he said there's two groups that appear before you each day. The followers of Christ and the followers of the world. In other words, we can think of it in different ways. We can think of, well, there's the Catholic Church, and there are those who are outside the Catholic Church. But even within the church, there can be those who want to also be part of the world and the spirit of the world. So this is why St. Louis says the real difference is the followers of Christ and the followers of the world. And the followers of Christ are a small band. And their exhortation to one another is, let us be faithful to our Lord. Let us do penance. Let us renounce the spirit of the world. Let us practice our faith. Let us pray. And the followers of the world say to one another, let us eat and drink and be merry. God is good. He did not create us to damn us. He does not want us to have fun. And so they continue in their path along the ways of the world. Remember what our Lord said when the apostles asked him once, are few saved? And he said, try to enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the path and broad is the way that lead to destruction, and many there are who enter that way. How straight the way and narrow the gate that leads to life, and few there are who find it. Not only must we have the true faith and remain faithful, to our Lord, to his church, to his teachings, but we also must renounce the spirit of the world, carry our cross, live lives of prayer 
and self-denial, faithful to the laws of the church. Faithful, for example, non-Catholics will say, well, why do you Catholics not eat meat on Friday? And they find that odd. And we say to them, well, first of all, our Lord died on the cross on Friday. But he also said, unless you do penance, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And we don't like to do penance. It's not something that's easy to do. So Holy Mother Church knows how we are very reluctant to do penance, self-denial. So the church requires us. The church makes us do penance, like we fast during Lent. We abstain from meat on Fridays as a sacrifice. Let us embrace that. Let us not look upon it begrudgingly. I can't have meat today. I know, I know one man, one parishioner of mine, who can't stand fish. And so he ends up not eating very much on Friday. And maybe that's for him the penance that he does. But the point is that the church requires us to do penance because of our own nature, of our own volition. If it were completely left to us, we would probably do very little penance. So renouncing the spirit of the world, embracing the cross. We can ask ourselves this, am I a true follower of Jesus? I look at his life and his teachings, and can I say that I'm truly deserving of the name Christian, which means a follower of Christ? <coughs> Certainly we all fall short, but that's our goal to strive for. So these are my thoughts as I reflect upon this gospel of the good tree and the bad tree, the good fruit and the bad fruit. And the bad fruit of Vatican II was especially apparent in the complete loss of the ideas of penance and renouncing the spirit of the world. Taking, I just mentioned Friday, that's one of the things that went by the wayside. And now in the, in the new Novus Ordo Church or Conciliar Church, there's no longer the requirement to abstain from meat on Friday and accept the Fridays of Lent. And you wonder how many of them even do that. So this embracing the spirit of the world, our Lord said, my kingdom is not of this world. And he even called Satan the prince of this world. And that spirit of the world, which inclines one to serve the devil more than our Lord is that which is condemned. So we recognize the bad fruits of Vatican II. And sometimes people who are new, and I'm talking to new people, and you're explaining about the doctrinal errors of Vatican II, sometimes it's easier for them to understand this simple lesson. What are the fruits that came about from all those changes in Vatican II and throughout the 60s and 70s, and that continue now in the modern church. What are the fruits? What are the results? The results are not good. The results are a loss of faith and embracing the spirit of the world and a loss of what it means to really follow our Lord. Let us then be faithful, not just to the faith, the doctrines of the faith, but also to living the way our Lord wants us to live renouncing the spirit of the world and looking upon our life in this world as pilgrims. We are like on a pilgrimage. We, God did not make us to live here forever. Let us not become overly attached to the things of this world. Let us not become preoccupied with money, with, with the things of this world, but look forward to eternity and prepare for eternity because perhaps very soon, sooner than we expect, God will call us to render an account for our lives. Did we have, did we produce good fruit or bad fruit? And so let us remember that this world is not our place of rest, is not our true home, that is heaven. May we always look forward to it. And then all the trials we experience in this life are much easier to bear when we look forward to heaven, to eternal happiness with God for all eternity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.